been a great conference, and I want to thank you again for organizing and joining us. You did a wonderful job, and thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I uh, had lunch with Vlad in Bangkok and his daughter on Friday, and Vlad was a little bit nervous about giving a presentation. He's never given a presentation in front of an audience before. And I told him just to relax and everything would be okay, but uh, when I arrived in Paris on Saturday morning, um, I was telling Didier that I, he's a little nervous, but everything will be all right. And Didier was like, no, it won't be all right. <laughs> and that's when we found out that he had spent the night in the hospital, and I don't think it was just nerves. Anyway, um, I first met Vlad uh, via email. And he contacted me and he said, you know, your book on Ruby and Sapphire is really wonderful. Why don't you do something on Spinel? And I said, well, you know, I don't think the market for Spinel is, is big enough to support a project of that size and I'm busy with other things. And he kept pestering me. Every year he would send me a calendar filled with some of his wonderfully candid pictures that he had taken around the world. And he kept saying, you know, you really need to do a book on Spinel. And when it came time, uh, 2010 rolled around, and he came back to me again, and he said, you know, you really need to do a book on Spinel, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it with you. And he handed me a manuscript, which was uh, a wonderful uh, collection of photographs of his Spinels uh, that he had taken, and he has a world-class collection of Spinel. And, and so he had, a, he, had, he had a wonderful manuscript, and I had a little bit of time, and I said, okay, you know, this, this looks like something that would be a lot of fun, and let's do this. But I want to tell you a little more about Vlad, because he's somebody that has a vision about things. He has a very refined sense of aesthetics, and that's carried over into his cutting. He's an excellent gem cutter. He's also uh, does jewelry design, and that carries into his jewelry design. But you can really see the sense of aesthetics that he possesses uh, when you look at his spinels. And to convince me to do this project, he brought out a piece of spinel that I'll show you later. But it was like a small replica of the Black Princess Ruby. And this, of course, is the most famous ruby in the world, and it's also the most famous spinel in the world. And we used that picture on the cover of the book that we did. It's called Terra Spinel. The book is now nearly out of print, and if you have a chance to meet Vlad at a show and get a copy of the book, I highly recommend it because it will become a collector's item, I'm sure, in the future. Anyway, Vlad asked the question, is this a, is this a, a ruby or a spinel? In fact, most of the world's famous rubies are not rubies at all. They're actually red spinels. And most of them come from uh, Barakshan, uh, what is now uh, Tajikistan, but it's uh, right on the border with Afghanistan. And so this is known as the Timur ruby. It's in the possession of the British queen who got it the way many of these gems are obtained through war. And it's actually engraved with a number of uh, inscriptions in Arabic, um, and it was thought to have been owned by Timur or, uh, in the past, but that idea has basically been debunked now. And we now know that it was probably never owned by Timur. Anyway, it's known as the Timur Ruby. Another famous uh, piece, um, and I'm personally not familiar with this one, but maybe some of the people in the audience are. It's a well-known piece. Uh, the Imperial State Crown, uh, as we like to say in the colored stone business, uh, diamonds make wonderful side stones. And you can see that here. Um, probably the greatest collection of spinels in the world is found in the Crown Jewels of Iran. And I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to go to Iran and see that. Iran, first of all, is a wonderful country. The people are very, very nice. And then the Crown Jewels is the world's greatest gem collection. And I 
have been to Iran twice. The last time was a couple of years ago. And I uh, was amazed because I came from, from Istanbul, from Turkey. And when I was in visiting the Tokapi Museum in Turkey, there were thousands and thousands of people. Um, and it was very hard to see the pieces because the crowds were so large. And I went to Tehran and I was there with 10 people looking at a collection that is the greatest in the world. You know, travel can be a great healer, and I urge you all, if you have the opportunity to visit Iran, it's a wonderful country, and the kind of boycotts that have been imposed on Iran uh, over the last uh, few decades are a real tragedy. So Vlad got a new, he started out with an interest in geology, and this was one of his uh, field trips that he took in 1987. Um, from here, from his interest in geology, he discovered gemstones. And one of his first major trips uh, was to Siberia. And he actually then visited uh, Tajikistan. And I'll just tell you a little story that he related to me. He said that he first visited Tajikistan by hitchhiking. And it took him a very, very long time because Tajikistan is at the outer edges of the Russian Empire. And so it took him a very long time to get there. Um, but he first got there by Hitchin. Well, what is unique about Spinel? This is the piece that is on the cover of the book, Tara Spinel. And when he rolled that across the table to me and I saw it, I just said, this is incredible. Uh, an ordinary cutter might have taken this piece of rough and simply faceted it, and no offense to Victor, of course, but, but Vlad did something extraordinary with it, and this is the result. Um, and that's something that Vlad has a wonderful talent in, is he has a very refined sense of aesthetics, and he has very strong opinions on what he wants about things. I'll tell you another story about that later. Here's another fabulous piece, um, a cobalt blue spinel from Vietnam. And you can see the color is extraordinary. Spinel is a wonderful gemstone. And I have to say that uh, I used to buy and sell a lot of spinels that I would buy on the Burmese border. And it was so undervalued at the time that I was buying these stones um, that if I could have those stones back today, uh, I would be uh, a very wealthy person. Um, stones that used to be two, three, five, ten, twenty dollars a carat are now selling for over a thousand dollars a carat and up. <coughs> Another piece. There's the original rough from Burma and the resulting cut stone. Simply magnificent. Spinel comes in so many different colors. The only color that you really don't find it in is an emerald green. Now, the spinel comes obviously from Burma, from the Mogok area, and there's another mine to the north of there, near the jade mines. It's on the road to the jade mines. It's a place called Nanyasai, or Namya, it's sometimes referred to. Um, and Vlad has spent a lot of time in Mogok, and the, the book that we did together is filled with some of his pictures throughout Mogul and also throughout Burma. Here's an example. And this is the Mogul Valley. Um, and that little building down on the right there that next to the next to the football field is, is the Mogok Motel, which for a long time was the only place to stay in town for foreigners. And this is the way Spinel is mined in Burma and the ever-present uh, cigar that the miner is smoking. Another example of a mining area in Burma for Spinel. I really like Vlad's people photography. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I look at it and there's a lot of technical imperfections, but he captures the spirit of a scene in a wonderful way that I really appreciate. Another example of uh, Burma, in this case, the area around Namyan or Nanyazek where they are famous for producing hot pink spinels. 
Now, here's some of the colors of Burmese spinel. These are the reds. Uh, one can argue, you know, what's the best color of red? And uh, I've seen very, very fine reds from Burma. I've also seen very, very fine reds from Mahenge in Tanzania. And I think uh, among so-called experts, it's a toss-up as to which is more favored in the market. Um, but one of the things that Vlad did with Spinel was that he set a base standard for the prices by be being willing to pay very high prices for stones. And as a result of that, his single-minded devotion to Spinel, he raised the prices of Spinel around the world um, in a way that their spinels today are trading at prices that are um, many, many times what they were trading at as little as 10 years or five years ago. And that's largely because of Vlad's work. More colors of spinel from Burma. I, I want to point out one particular color This up there. When I was when I was working with Vlad on the book, um, he had so many lovely stones, and he had this gray spinel, gray color. And I said, Vlad, you have so many beautiful colors of spinel. Uh, why do you want to put the gray one in the book? And he. <laughs> He looked at me and he said, I think gray is beautiful. And I didn't know what to say. And I'd been in the business for a very, very long time and I simply didn't know what to say. And at that point, I realized for the first time that you cannot tell somebody what is beautiful. That this is a very, very personal choice. And I had spent so many years in the business and not understood that concept, but that's something that Vlad taught me, and I'll never forget it. And you know what gray spinels are selling for nowadays? Over a thousand dollars a carat for large, fine, clean gray spinels, largely because of Vlad. Pink spinels from Burma. And there are so many lovely, lovely shades of pink that uh, spinel is found in. Um, and Burma is a lovely place for that. And here you can see some of the other colors, the so called gray to mauve colors, um, all beautifully cut. Sri Lanka is another very famous place. Uh, we don't know where the first source of spinel was. It could have been Burma, it could have been Sri Lanka. Certainly in Burma, the people that, people were living in caves in the Mogok area because they found the tools. I mentioned that earlier today. And so the, the people that were uh, in Mogok, the earliest humans, certainly discovered the spinels. But there are also early humans living in Sri Lanka. And so uh, the history of spinel literally goes back to the dawn of time. And here's some examples of the mining areas in Sri Lanka. And what kind of colors do they find there? Well, spinel in, in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka does not produce the most expensive. I'm not going to use the word best, right? I'm not going to use the word most beautiful. Sri Lanka does not produce the most expensive red spinels, but it does produce the most expensive blue spinels. And we've seen some extraordinary stones uh, over the last few weeks, few months, uh, cobalt blue stones from Sri Lanka as well as a very, very large piece that was nearly 100 carats uh, that was an absolute amethyst color. If you looked at it, you would, you would think it was an amethyst. And it was a spinel uh, from Sri Lanka. Tajikistan, this is where Vlad first really fell in love with spinel. He hitchhiked to this place called Kuilal, which is right on the Afghan border. 
And this is where all of the storied spinels of, of former times came from, the Black Prince's ruby, the Timor ruby, uh, the pieces that are found in the Persian crown jewels, in the crown jewels of uh, many of the royal families around the world. They are believed to come from this deposit at Kuilal. It's a spectacular place. Um, and here you can see uh, the area at Kuilal. I visited there in 2006, and it's one of the prettiest places that I've been. As you can see, this is the Panj River. The you know, left bank is Afghanistan. The right bank is Tajikistan. And that village that you see there is the village of Kuhilal. And the mines are just above that. Uh, these mines were mentioned by Marco Polo. Uh, they're very, very ancient mines. And I remember spending one afternoon crawling through some of these ancient galleries with Vincent and uh, another friend of ours, Travel Buddy. And here you can see the tunnels from the government mine. And uh, it is a mechanized mine, and the tunnels go very deep into the mountain. Still producing today, but most of the production today is in a pink color. Something like this. But when you get the bigger sizes, then the color builds up to a very fine red, as you can see here. And this is the Tajich Tanzania. Tanzania also produces wonderful spinel. Uh, those of you who remember the big find in 2007, uh, in 2007, they, at, at a place called Mahenge, they discovered several large crystals. The biggest was over 50 kilograms. And I think more than anything else, that set off the current boom of spinel. Um, and we've really never looked back since that time. For the first time, large quantities of red spinels came into the market, and the color consistency was unbelievable, um, where people were making suites of jewelry with this lovely red spinel, and it was quite incredible. Of course, there are many Maasai people living in Tanzania. You can see some. Spinel is also found in the Umba area. And here are some of the colors that you get. And you can see these vibrant reds from the Mahenge area. Madagascar, another important place for spinel. You kind of get the idea here that spinel occurs wherever you get ruby and sapphire. And that's generally true. Because the spinel is basically a, a ruby or a sapphire with a little bit of magnesium added to it. And you get some lovely blue-violet colors in Madagascar. Mostly mined from the Ilocoque area in the south. And Vietnam. Vietnam has uh, spinel mines in the Yen Tê, Yen Bai, Luc Yen area north of Hanoi. And you can see the mining area here. There's a reason why Vietnamese skin is very light, because usually it's cloudy. And, uh, and the Luc Yen area is typically very cloudy, very, very humid, um, very, very hot in the summertime. And this is the market at Yen Tê, where they sell some gemstones. Production, unfortunately, in Vietnam is very low at the current time. Um, it's a lot of it is hard rock mining, and there's not a lot being produced. But when they do find stones, uh, some of them are absolutely stunning. They find stones in a rose, red shade, and more light blues, occasionally a cobalt blue stone like you see there in the center, but that's incredibly rare. Most of the blue spinels in Vietnam tend to be in a, a lighter sky blue. And just a note, there is no real green spinel. This is not a. Uh, this is not the spinel spinel of the spinel group. I think this is a different uh, member of the spinel group. So, even though spinel, they say it's a cult stone. Um, actually, it's extremely popular among gem dealers. It's sort of. 
among the intelligentsia, spinel is very popular because it has a lot of the beauty of ruby and sapphire at a fraction of the price. Traditionally, spinel is traded at about 10% of the price of a fine ruby for a fine red spinel. Um, but that's uh, really begun to change, and now you regularly see spinels that are being offered for thousands of dollars a carat in the pink colors, and even tens of thousands of dollars a carat in the better reds. I'm not exactly sure what Vlad meant by this, but I'll, I will tell you this, that the Arabs, they had a very advanced knowledge of mineralogy. And there were Arabs who knew about the heat treatment, it's going back a thousand years, they knew about the heat treatment of ruby in uh, Sri Lanka. They described the process very accurately a thousand years ago. Um, and one of the Arabs who was very famous, a guy named El Baruni, who lived about a thousand years ago, he actually described very accurately the difference between ruby and spinel. And he had one term that he used for ruby and another for spinel. And how did he separate them? Well, he separated them by specific gravity. He was a brilliant guy. He wrote a number of books about astronomy and everything else. Um, but he measured all the specific gravities of the major gemstones and separated them by that way. If you ever have a chance to get his book, I highly recommend it. He actually had a pretty good sense of humor as well. Uh, I remember one passage in the book where he was talking about a friend of his, and he said, the man is an absolute scoundrel, but he really knows his pearls. <coughs> and, of course, this is the cover of the book, Terra Spinel. Like I said, if you have a chance to get it, there are very few copies left, um, but it is the life's work of Vlad um, and I, it's, it's so sad that he can't be here today to tell you about it in his own words, but I hope I've done it justice. And this is Vlad Thank you very much.